Wonderful. We have a wonderful group of people. This is terrific. Thank you all so much for joining us on the Artist's Outlook here on a beautiful Thursday evening. We really appreciate you watching and we appreciate your support at the Appleton Museum of Art. I'm Patricia Tomlinson. I'm the curator at the Appleton Museum of Art. And we have a very special guest this evening, a very talented painter, Christopher Still. He is a native Floridian and I'm not gonna to say too much about him because I'm gonna let him introduce himself, but he, we have two paintings of his in our collection. We love them. They are absolute visitor favorites, and we are thrilled that he's here. So, Christopher, would you like to tell everyone a little bit about yourself, please? Good afternoon. Um, well, thank you for including me and including me in your beautiful museum. Uh, I was born in Clearwater, Florida, uh, and uh, benefited from uh, being in art classes. Uh, that led me to going to the Pennsylvania Academy of the Fine Arts in Philadelphia. And that led me to working in Europe. And the whole time I had always hoped to return to the beautiful state of Florida and uh, try my best to portray what I find so beautiful about living here. Lovely, thank you. Um, then let's just get right into the questions. Um, I think a lot of, of the, our viewers are familiar with their art. I see a lot of familiar names in our in our participants section. But let's just go over some basic questions for those that may not be quite as familiar with your work. Um, you, can you talk about some influences, just really generally, talk about some influences on your work? How did you get in started? Who and possibly what influenced you? Well, um, I had a, a great grandmother who was a painter and um, I saw a lot of painting and my father was actually uh, attended the Ringling School of Art as a young man. Um, I, there was a lot of creativity in our home. Uh, I, I'm only coming to realize the opportunities I had by living in Florida that you had uh, artists coming who were retiring or visiting family here in the area. And I was attending classes at a place called the Florida Gulf Coast Art Center and the Dunedin Fine Art Center that I was surrounded with a lot of adults. There weren't a lot of children's classes when I was little. And, uh, and I had a great foundation um, where both of those art centers gave me scholarships every afternoon after school to attend adult art classes probably since uh, second grade up till graduating high school. So um, that was that was a great influence, was education, you know. Was it intimidating for you being basically the sole youth in amidst adults? Was that we a little weird? <laughs> no, I I am I probably if I was in school now, I would be the kid that they would uh, stamp ADD. Uh, I, I actually, when I was in classes with other kids, sometimes I had the tendency to not concentrate as much. Um, sitting with everyone being focused like that actually uh, was a great environment to, to, to sit in the room with other people who were serious about painting. Um, so I enjoyed it. That's wonderful. That's that speaks a lot of your to your passion that that wasn't intimidating because I know I, some young people that would probably be a little intense. <laughs> yeah. Well, um, you know, uh, they uh, it it was it was more of an era where an adult was allowed to tell a child to be quiet, <laughs> and so if if uh, if I wasn't being taking quiet and being serious in the class, there, there would certainly would be someone in the room would tell me to uh, straighten up. So, um, so it worked well for everybody. Yeah, they pull, they pull that children should be seen and not heard part. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Wonderful. So I want to get into a little bit of, I guess, how, how you create your artwork. I've, 
I've heard a lot about how you create things, but I don't know if they're apocryphal stories. So I think it would be interesting. I've heard an enormous amount of research for, on your end goes into every single thing you do. Can you talk a little bit about how you craft your images? I, I am sure that seeing my father teaching a history class when I was a child, that he felt that the community was this wealth of information and he would send his students out with a reel-to-reel -reel tape recorder to when they were researching an event to find people in the community who actually lived that event. And uh, I, I, I don't think of history and research so much as illustrating history as much as I think as of it as another texture. To, to making a painting. Um, I, uh, I find that if I have an emotional, personal response to the object that I'm painting, my, my, the, the level of how I portray that object is, is multiplied. So um, like in the little detail you can see behind me faintly, every one of those shells was given to me by a different family member with a separate story on each shell. And that makes me look at an object in a totally different frame of mind. Um, I don't know if that answers. Anything. Yes, it does. That's, that's actually a lovely story because it's not just some random shell. It's a shell you know and love, so to speak. It's a shell you know, so to speak. Right, yes. That's yeah. really lovely. And I'm the, I'm the beneficiary of that. I mean, I don't know a lot of things, but uh, you know, I've, I've had the pleasure of looking at the surface of an orange for uh, you know, a week or a shell for a month. Um, and uh, it, it's, uh, I, th I think the idea in a lot of people's minds is of an artist is the Van Gogh. Uh, that that you're uh, alone, adrift. Um, uh, I I I I am perhaps tortured by myself, but um, but not to any any severe degree. Uh, other than I hope to, I have high demands for what I'd like. You know what I hope to do, but um, I. I, my work, rather than being that lone person in the field, I go out into the world and by the time I'm finished with the piece, I may have interacted in the case of like the House of Representative murals. Um, when we went to the credits, I had worked with over a thousand individuals. And so um, them telling me about a piece and then uh, learning about it from all different angles. Uh, eventually, uh, I have to completely disregard that element and look at it as a work of art alone. And, um, and so I would think of the history and the research the same as I would think of as what I, how I would wanna look at the complexity of color, how I'd wanna look at composition, how I'd wanna look at how I'm going to uh, technique-wise approach the piece. So, um, but anyway. No, that's really interesting. So since you do interact with and often picture real living individuals, have you ever had any of them say, oh yeah, you know, you made me too heavy, you made me too thin. Do you always, ever get critiqued? Always, <laughs> <laughs> always. Uh, I, 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 it was interesting, I did a, a painting for Ruth Eckert Hall and uh, they commissioned me and in the contract, I, I specified there would be no portraits and no likenesses of anyone, which then I built a, a, uh, a box, viewing box that I was on the stage for almost two years, uh, one by one, getting the list of the patrons and doing studies of of the patrons of the hall until by the time the piece was done, there's 1,221 portraits in the painting. 
And I did that because I found that when I researched group portraits, the, the great group portraits that had been done uh, through history never made anyone happy. The, 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 ones, the ones that made everybody happy were the ones where everyone's head was like a football, the same size and was evenly lit. And to make a painting dynamic, you, you have to have some people in shadow, some people turn, some, so, so that gave me the freedom. They were surprised at the end that they were in it rather than disappointed that it didn't look like them. So that, that was one way of uh, approaching that. But it's a, it's, it's a difficult thing with including people. Um, I, I uh, painted a conquistador. Uh, I was portraying Ponce de Leon in one of the house murals. And I had this poor gentleman pose for three months in the armor. And I knew this other man, Stefano Longinotti, who was from Europe, came walking in the studio and he was just the perfect head. And I had to sand out this other guy's head and put on Stefano's head. And it was like, you know, uh, so at any point, you know, it is hard when you, you know, you don't want to hurt feelings. You want to include people. Uh, and so I go about, go back and forth between being very social, doing research, looking, being outside, painting, to being a reclusive hermit that comes in my studio for, you know, a year at a time, seeing nobody once I start. Because once I get into doing that, other than the models posing or something, you know, um, uh, so. Okay, that, that's, so a word to the wise folks, Christopher could take your head and put it somewhere else. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, you know, I, I, you know I, I'm tossed between the loyalty of doing a good work of art and the loyalty of, of the friendship that the people share by uh, subjecting themselves to uh, being models. So that's a tough, it's a tough thing for them to do. Mm -hmm. So why don't we go to the slides so we can enjoy your gorgeous work. So let's do this. So do you want to tell everyone a little bit about this beautiful piece? Well, hopefully in appearance, um, it, it should like look like a, a coastal large coastal structure. That's the Bellevue Biltmore. Um, that uh, is a recent painting uh, that was approximately nine feet by, I, I believe five feet tall. And um, uh, that area now has modern condominiums, uh, the city of Clearwater behind it. Um, I went through a, a process of trying to paint a view of this place that showed just how uh, incredible it was that when Florida was still a wilderness that they, during that golden era, they were, they were building uh, such structures. And that was, that was quite, uh, there was a film made about that that uh, gets into that, that uh, um, is available through the Bellevue Inn. Oh, that's good to know. Um, one of the things that really has always struck me about your work, um, the sky is an active, in addition to water, and we'll get to that in a bit, but the sky is an active participant in your work. It's like another individual in your work. Do you oh. want to talk a little bit about? Well, I, you know, I, I often have people, which I have painted out West and I've painted in, in other places in the world. Uh, a lot of people always tell me, oh, you, you know, you should, you should uh, see the mountains, you should, you know, and I, and I always, I always say, or people say, oh, if you, you should see the light in southern France, and I, and I painted in southern France, and I, I, I often tell them, have you seen the light in Florida in the afternoons when the setting sun hits the, the mountainous clouds that we have? And I, and I think uh, uh, I, I, I'm obviously very spiritually drawn to sky and water. 
and um, um, and I and I appreciate that you noticed that. Absolutely, and I love your little rainbow here too. Your little kiss of a rainbow. If you oh, yeah. can see my cursor, I think that's really wonderful too. Oh well, thank you. It's this this piece um, is uh, has more than a hundred different iconic uh, historical references. Uh, on the property, there were all of the photographs that were taken uh, in that age, but you could never see the whole building or you couldn't see the train arriving or you couldn't see Henry Plant's steamship or the spring house or, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And, uh, and so, um, uh, even though, you know, I try to keep the composition simple, uh, you know, you can see figures in the windows and, and other things. Uh, there's always a danger with, uh, with realism that, you know, you can, you have to be careful to not get so caught up in the details that you lose a beautiful composition or the abstract balance that has to be in any good painting. That's an excellent point. Let's let's look at another one. Um, another thing I wanted to touch upon is you obviously you can see it very clearly here have a, a, a sort of a photorealistic vein going through your work. I mean, this almost looks like a photograph. Mm -hmm. So, do you want to talk about what? I, I guess I guess I want to back up. Obviously, you don't do abstracts, and this type of photorealistic look truly appears to be your heart. Do you want to talk a little bit about that and why you are so in love with this particular way of depicting? Does that make sense? Yeah, I, I, I think um, uh, that it, it's often interesting if you turn these paintings upside down, you see the mechanics of that, uh, that you, 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 you have to always deal compositionally with uh, bigger abstract shapes. Um, one, of the, one of the interesting things about really realistic realism, you know, um, is that you have to accept that shapes, colors, and edges are not what you would uh, think they are. Uh, so uh, uh, I, I, when I'm in a place, I have to get the color relationships first. So I do very quick uh, studies outside on location and then might decide on a technique that uh, may take a year or more to accomplish. And uh, I feel somewhat bound with the advent of photography, we haven't necessarily gotten better paintings. Uh, that the importance of experiencing something, having something to say, having the piece symbolic of, of, of what your message is, um, is, is, a, is a very old, tradition that that you know I, I I think I am bound a little bit to saying I want to portray the earth that I'm seeing uh, for others to see if I could only portray it as beautifully as what I'm experiencing is is kind of the goal uh, I would say beauty is definitely a goal uh, in my work um, there might be much darker uh, elements that I deal with in a different way. Uh, this, 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 this painting is called Incoming Tide. This is uh, an area I saw a lot growing up. That's Caladesi Island off the coast. And um, you see the one sailboat in the distance freely moving across the horizon. Uh, the sailboat that's in the foreground is really uh, is, is stuck. And um, 
in my meaning in the incoming tide is sometimes you just in life you have to wait for the rise and the fall of tides much like emotion much like good times and bad times uh, that this you, you're not going to do anything about it sometimes you have to sit on the boat and wait for the water to come in to lift you while looking off at the horizon imagining what it will be like to move freely again and so um uh those those types of things are embedded in the painting and i think people sense that um uh, hopefully um I always like to do a picture that someone will come in and say, I think this is beautiful, but if you want to learn, if you want to know more about what's in there, um, I, you know, uh, I think, I think, uh, I think that's part of my interest. Okay. Well put. Um, yeah, this is, this is a beauty. It's, it's, and that's that. Thank you for sharing the sort of the story behind it too, because I think that's also very interesting when your artworks have a deeper meaning, people really like to hear that. So I think that's very fascinating that you've got kind of the free and the stuck and the, you know, the just wait and see and the let's go to it, <laughs> all kind of combining. And there's a little map of Florida there in the mud flats in those reflections too, by the way. Really? Um, Do tell yes. where. I'll put, uh, I'll put my cursor on it. Yeah, you, you have to raise the cursor up a little bit higher there. There, uh, there, there uh, up a little bit more. The, uh, now to your, to my left, to your left, I guess too. Left, oops, right no. here. Uh, down. Oh, there. there. Yeah, yeah. Okay, I see it, yep. Um, right but I, I was just completely blown away by this prismatic effect in the water that you, you have basically the Roy G. Biv, red, orange, green, yellow, blue, violet, uh, moving across the water in the puddles and through the sky. But uh, uh, it's lovely. Well, that's that's why people love Florida. This pretty much encapsulates it. It's gorgeous. Let's go to the next one. Another big, beautiful sunset. You want to talk about this piece a little bit, please? Yeah, I this. Um, I was really, I was really excited. Uh, I was down uh, working in Naples, and I was, I, I like, I like municipal piers, uh, partially because there's something about people gathering at a sunset and walking down a pier that um, that uh, class and age and uh, uh, race and uh, all different kinds of barriers seem to disappear, disappear with people uh, walking on, looking to see who's caught a fish, who had, who, you know, and, and as you share the sun going down, there's kind of this incredible common bond that happens um, at sunset on these municipal piers. So I had, I had uh, suggested to a gallery and they, uh, they wanted to do a show of my work down in Naples. They're like, what do you want to do? And I said, well, I, I, what I'd like to do is about a, from one wall to the other, I'd like to do this 15 foot painting of your pier there. And they were like, oh, well, you know, we really don't know about that. Uh, um, and I, I said, well, uh, you know, I, I, I feel I'm going to be doing this. So when I came back, uh, the folks uh, of um, Ocean Properties who work with uh, Sand Pearl, where I did a, another project, had uh, showed me this space and uh, on Clearwater Beach. And they said, do you have any ideas? And uh, when I went out on the beach, I could see this pier, Pier 60, which I had, I had grown up on going out fishing. Uh, you know, someone passes away, you go out to the pier. On your prom night in high school, you go out and walk on the pier. If it's people are visiting in town, you go out on the pier. And, and yet, it isn't, and this is often the case of the subject of my paintings, these are often not the subjects that people think of as worthy of being important museum subjects. 
Uh, and, uh, and so if you could see this painting closer, you would see uh, people of all different ages walking across the pier. Um, and, um, you know, it was funny after their sand pearl and ocean properties uh, open, Opal Sands open, Clearwater Beach got named the best beach in the United States. And um, somebody was looking at this painting uh, and they said, oh gosh, you do such a historic view. Uh, this is it really the past uh, Clearwater Beach. And I, and I hadn't realized that when I painted this, I had put so few people in it. Now, when you go to that beach, it's, it's almost like being in Europe where there's four rows of umbrellas going up the beach. You'd never be able to see a view like this of sunset anymore that it's become uh, so popular uh, there. So um, that little bit of it's nostalgic for my childhood, a little bit of it's commentary on our life. You might notice just real quick and then I'll stop but the beach umbrellas uh, that are at the, the base of the closest end of the, um, uh, of the pier, mm -hmm. that they are a Roy G. Biv, red, orange, again, the spectrum. And one of the interesting things for me is how do you make that sun look as bright as it is? And what you have is a transition of color uh, from one end of the painting, the, the actual shape of the painting makes the illusion happen that the colors transition so that the colors that are on the umbrella, what appears to be yellow, is almost a light brown because the painting becomes progressively violet as you, as you go um, off to the side and becomes pro progressively red orange as you go to the left. And so um, I'm, I'm fascinated with color. I, was, I, I studied with an impressionist. So, um, but anyway, that's another. That explains a lot because I, I was going to get to that. So that's a perfect segue. Um, I see a lot, for example, the foam here in the last, um, I'm gonna go back real very quickly, your rocks. That's, that absolutely is impressionistic to my eye. Absolutely. Yes. Uh, and, and quite honestly, you know, when the paintings do, as you, you, you say, there, there is a, a, a certainly a strong element of realism, but if you looked up, uh, if you look at the paintings very close, they're actually, actually like hyper impressionistic uh, with thousands of little specks of color. And, and, and that is a little bit of a balance when you ask how, what my influences were. Um, I uh, met and studied with a painter whose training had started with uh, in the Ashcan painters uh, leading back to some of the American Impressionists. And we would go out and we would paint and he, Louis Sloan is his name, and he was an Impressionist. And then I had the opportunity to leave an apprentice under a Renaissance fresco painter painting in 16th century fresco techniques in Florence for the Vatican, an apprentice under them. So I, I got tone, rendering, planning, composition, and then somehow those two worlds kind of have met with a lot of other artists uh, in between that um, I'm, I'm merging, if you took some of these paintings, you put them with paintings of the past, if you could put them in a room with paintings of the past, you would find that they are modernly colorful uh, in a color range that people at the time when they were doing realism really didn't have that palette yet because impressionism uh, really uh, changed the way we view color. So I, I combine real, you know, tonalism with impressionism, which is a little, is a, is a luxury of a modern age. Mm -hmm. I agree. And thank you for mentioning Sloan, a fantastic painter. For those of you watching, if you are not familiar with him, absolutely Google him. He's a 
fabulous painter. So thank you for mentioning that as well. Another quick thing before we go on to the next one too, correct me if I'm reading too much into this, but part of what I see in your work time and time again as well is not just the gaze of the person standing to the side, but almost the gaze of the person who's comfortable gazing alone to an extent. For example, this little pail, it's just sitting there all alone, but it seems contentedly alone, if that uh, makes sense. That's nice. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, uh, uh, well, that's a good, that's a good observation. Uh, Thank you. Well, I think, I think we'll see it again here. I mean, you're observing water and, but it doesn't feel, it, it feels friendly. I, I don't know what, what another way to put it, but to obvi it's obvious that you're a Floridian to me, very obvious. It's well, obvious in, in, you know, there's, a, there's an interesting thing that um, I can go landscape paint all around this whole state. And um, absolutely people who are from that region, there is a difference between the waves in, in, in every little coastal town around the state. There's a difference in the way our trees look, the way the rivers look, the way, you know, it, it's, it's, it's terribly, terribly unique. Um, I did a painting for the Sand Pearl where I showed, um, I took an area in, and uh, isolated a, a two foot by four foot area and visited that part of the beach that I'd grown up on with a different expert for a year, every, every couple times a week to learn about. So I, I, I orchestrated a, a beach that, um, and then did an underwater painting that showed all of the things alive. And it was the first time that I realized when I was talking to some people who were visiting here that they were uncomfortable with how many things were alive <laughs> when they went swimming. And for me, you know, I am deeply disturbed that there's less and less things alive when I go uh, look uh, in the water because of the changing water quality in places. So um, I, I am very uh, attached to and feel, you know, um, gosh, the, the Gulf Coast is such a, uh, the water is such an inviting, uh, comforting. Well, every coastal area in Florida is, to me, uh, non-threatening. You know. well, and I see that someone raised their hand, but can we please wait to the end? Um, we are, we'll be taking questions in the comments at, at the end. So if you could please hold that thought, hold that question, and we'll, we'll address it at the end if you could type it in the chat. Another thing I wanted to mention quickly before we move on, Christopher, oh, well, actually something I wanted to ask, have, ha, are you also influenced by some of the great maritime painters? Because I see some Montague Dawson in your waves. And I know he's famous for his ships, but Montague Dawson's waves are fantastic. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I, uh, I pr pro a lot, probably a lot of, uh, a great deal of my water influences could be uh, uh, connected to the Hudson River School painters combined with my love for Soroya and uh, Monet. And um, uh, again, you, you can kind of see that impressionistic uh, influence. You know, uh, of course, if you see the sparkles on the water uh, of, the, of this water, uh, that doesn't, that leaves you a whole range of color for all of the other things that are supposed to be white foam. So the reality is, is all that white foam is a whole myriad of hues of blue and pastel and light greens uh, uh, and violets or else the sparkle of the water wouldn't, uh, wouldn't work. Um, so, um, 
But anyway. No, that, that makes perfect sense. So let's move on. Um, this is one of my favorites that you've done. I think it's just endlessly lovely. And it really brings the great seal to literally to life. Um, when you look at the seals of different states, they can look a little flat. They can look a little boring. Sometimes, quite frankly, it's hard to see what's in them if they pack them quite full. <laughs> so this is this is really, for me, brings it home. Do you want to talk about this a little bit, please? Well, and again, that's that's taking a subject. I think you know we have the seal on our on our uh, driver's license. It's on the flag. You know. Uh, you know, I, I was wanting to ask the question, what's in the seal? Why did we choose uh, the elements that we did for the seal? Uh, this is Susie Henry, uh, uh, a family that has worked with me over the years on many projects. Her father is a medicine man for the Seminole tribe. And um, uh, she's, you know, in the, in the actual seal, the, the figure is standing under the palm tree. And, um, and you know, I, I kind of found it in our, you know, in our state history, we actually made a, an effort to try to uh, eliminate the native tribes that were living in our state. And it's, and it's quite something that we now uh, see them as the symbol of our state. So I, I, I was wanting to speak to those things. Her bracelet, if you could see it up closely, are all of the, the different seals that have taken place since the first territorial seal of the state. Um, the palm tree is actually the palm tree. I went to the, find the artist that had created the seal and asked him where they got that palm tree, which that palm tree is behind the old Capitol. And so, uh, uh, you know, what kind of flower was it supposed to be? Hibiscus moschutus, which is a, a, a marshmallow uh, that grows that in your area in Ocala is probably one where I found that around uh, uh, Silver River uh, driving over uh, in that area uh, towards uh, Palatka and St. Augustine. Uh, there's some marsh, marshy areas near the Oklawaha River that uh, the marshmallow uh, uh, blooms. And that's probably, I, that's, I'm sure that's where I found it. So of course the woods painted around it to give the illusion uh, of, of, uh, of depth to say, it, we're not just a, it's not just a seal, it's, it's it's, you know, I wanted to make you feel the fabric, feel the person. And we'll see her again. And I mean, she's been, Susie Henry and Bobby Henry have been in a lot of my paintings. And I love how you, but not only did you bring this native woman to the forefront, because of course the history of native peoples is so very important to Florida, but also you have her literally breaking out into our world. And I think that's just marvelous. Oh, well, thank you. It really adds a lot of and there's, there's a, it, It's no, it's no, um, it's no mistake that her hand is on the word trust. Um, you know, you can see we trust. Um, uh, it's, uh, it's 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 an interesting thing as we're moving into a modern area to to uh, to uh, be working with the Seminole tribe as they they're they're trying to you know as they continually navigate um, their past with uh, the future. Mm -hmm. Lovely, lovely piece. So moving on, I think she is she she's in this one as well, is she not? She is. You want to um, talk about this piece a little, please? Well, and it's kind of, this is a nice segue. Uh, the, the man in the house mural, Stefano Longinotti, that I thought should really be Ponce de Leon, uh, is uh, in the left uh, part of the triptych. Um, I actually had a seamstress 
uh, Renaissance uh, seamstress in St. Augustine make more of an accurate uh, costume for Ponce de Leon because we we think of we think of him wearing the Marian, but that was actually later. And uh, but anyway, so what this is is uh, done in the style of an altar piece, like uh, uh, a triptych that you might see. Uh, in one of the things that I did about this, one of the ideas behind this painting was, I was painting the painting almost in a style that was being used at the time when Florida was discovered. So uh, it's a little further higher Renaissance than, than when Florida was discovered, so, but, um, but my, my, my point was that I, I, I traveled for over four years um, going to Cuba, um, to Spain, to locate Ponce de Leon's hometown. Um, he wears a, a, if you could see close on the painting, he's wearing a crucifix around his neck, which is actually the cross that hangs over uh, in, it hangs in the church where Ponce de Leon was baptized as a child in Spain. And a little bit of that is, you know, I, I get lost in the minutia, uh, uh, but um, as I was thinking about this child being baptized in water and that how he would become this eternal legacy of the fountain of youth. Um, um, so, um, and he's actually painted in the room, uh, the, the rooms that they're in, those two side figures are the, are the cell in which Osceola was imprisoned in, um, in St. Augustine. There's, there's hundreds of, that's the USS Florida punch bowl, uh, that's in the governor's mansion. Um, uh, it is by law I'm not allowed to leave the governor's mansion. So the, uh, the governor was very kind to let me set up my whole uh, set up in the governor's mansion to paint that punch pole. Um, the, uh, the, the punch pole is filled with native flowers, again, to your area, which would, uh, there's, there's references to Bartram. Uh, and and Kat, Catesby um, in, in that, uh, but well, anyway, it's it's filled with with a host of iconic moments in Florida history, uh, and this this painting served as part of the celebration for uh, Florida's um, anniversary, and. Uh, so uh, it was unveiled in St. Augustine and it was displayed in the governor's mansion for um, visiting dignitaries. But anyway. It's lovely. I, I love how you can identify, you know, this red snapper and various species. You could, you, as you said, you can get completely lost in this painting, just having fun looking at all the different things and identifying them. Well, and, and people who know my work really well will see things move that, not only is a painting, uh, you know, if you look closely in the punch bowl, if you could look very closely in the rim of it, you actually see a reflection of all the house murals uh, going around the, the rim of the punch bowl in that. Uh, but um, I, I often say to people, as much as I wish you could see details, I, I, uh, I, I'm, I'm frustrated to lose meaning. You know, I, I just feel like we live in this incredible, beautiful state with an incredible history. And um, uh, I, uh, so the, the, the objects that are in the painting continue to tell a story by them leaving the painting and going into my other paintings. There are, um, that horse conch, that you see behind me back here uh, and the queen conch that's in this painting 
are in that painting that you're looking at. That's a lovely thread of continuity. I, I like that a lot. That's really wonderful. Let's look at the next one. And this is setting us up for what is in our collection. It's coming. So do you want to talk a little bit about this piece? Well, I, I again, you know, um, uh, everyone's got a different way of expressing themselves. Uh, when uh, one of my favorite places to go is Apalachicola. Um, I've painted on Apalachicola Bay, painting the oystermen for, for years and years and years. And, uh, and when I heard that the oil spill had happened, the deep water horizon had happened, uh, my reaction was to basically uh, race up there and paint, want to paint the beauty of the place. Uh, and it, at the time, you know, I hadn't fully thought of how these fishermen were going to be like our vanishing cowboys. Um, but um, on the outside, this is a, this on a different level, um, uh, on a personal level, when you, you expressed earlier that you noticed that the figures were possibly alone, um, this, this uh, painting is for me personally expressing my joy of, of having the support of my family. And my, I, I, think, I think maybe when I go out into nature and I'm comfortable being alone or, in that space, it's like I, I I don't fear the support that I have in my life. And if you look at this painting, it might look beautiful in one sense. That's the Evans family. You can see on the horizon there's a faint diagonal of clouds, which is actually implying the burning oil rig of the deep horizon. And um, the Evans family, you know, all they could do, my feeling of this painting is, is in life, we're in a boat with a certain group of friends or family. And we're lifted and dropped by the tide, by waves. And sometimes all you can do is just keep working together. And that oil didn't actually reach Apalachicola Bay but there's uh, fears that we all have of something on the horizon. Everyone's got different things to deal with in their life. And these figures, the one older boy who's getting to the point where he's gonna graduate from high school, will he go in the, you know, his options are few. He's either gonna maybe go in the military or continuing fishing as his family has done for generations. He's looking off at that horizon and, um, and his mother and father are, are hard at work. And um, uh, I, you know, I circled this family for a long, long time. Uh, and I, one early morning I came up on them and it, it is a great segue into the piece that you, that uh, this piece followed uh, the piece that's in your collection. Okay. So moving on to our beloved, beloved, and my father before me. Yes, and that that was actually, uh, you know, um, again, I think one of the things painting can do that photography creates evidence of of things uh, uh, to me. Uh, a painting uh, is, is purposeful. One of the things that I, I got from that Renaissance training was that pre-photography, you had all of your models individually posing. So everything that you did was an intentional uh, pose. Often when you take a random photograph, sometimes if you're a great photographer, you, you can have everything line up where you want it to be. But most of the time, if you have this many people, someone's got 
a hand coming out of their head or it doesn't, you know, something isn't quite right. The morning that I saw them in that most of the, my studies came from this, it was actually a calm day. Uh, the, the water was actually flat calm. And uh, on uh, several days later during a storm, um, I, I saw the water and added um, the water. Um, a, you, you can't see it, but up in the top, there's a little jets from Eglin Air Force Base going across the sky. And um, this painting to me, if I, could, if I could say it's emulating something, it's a combination of a crucifixion where the, the tongs of the oyster tongs are crossing almost like they're lifting up a cross. It's, it's a combination of the iconic uh, um, uh, troops at Okinawa raising the American flag. Uh, it's like a Caravaggist, um, it, it is like a crucifixion. And, um, and then you have the undercurrents of the parables of the fishermen not, fearing when they're in a storm, uh, the color of the water and the issues that Apalachicola Bay with water coming down from Atlanta changing. Um, and, and all of that, I don't need you to know when you're looking at the, the painting, but the, that uh, I feel like uh, the, the burlap bags and this kind of work and the, the the, the beauty of this is an American icon to me of, of life. And uh, these, these, this family is just sweet as can be. Um, uh, they, they lived in Carabelle. Uh, they've moved since. I, I remember we invited them to come to the Appleton Museum to see the uh, unveiling of the painting and uh, Mrs. Evans said to me um, that she was gonna buy a dress because she had never been in a big city before. And there you have it. <laughs> so the last one is a little bit of a departure. We're moving inland on this one. So let's also owned by the Appleton and a favorite, but really quite different than the other one. Do you wanna talk about this piece for a little bit? Well, I. I think I'm, I think I'm always, I think when people see a painting like La Florida, the triptych, or they see, and my father before me, they don't see the 50 plus paintings that are done on location that make that happen, that are generally more, much more impressionistic. This painting uh, was part of my studies being done on the Ocklawaha River um, for a painting called The River's Path. And this, if you look in the, in, you know, in that painting, you'll find that the, that the confluence of where the Ocklawaha River meets Silver River, that the dark tannin waters run side by side with the clear waters of the Silver River, that this was a study for, even though this painting is 20, you know, two feet by three feet, it was actually a study for uh, an area that is in that painting is only probably two inches by one inch. And so um, that's sometimes why I get hesitant where to me it all looks the same because it's like, these are, this is a different, um, and then sometimes I just love painting impressionistic landscape. And uh, uh, I, I, there's nothing more beautiful than taking a boat trip uh, up Silver River and, and then heading up the Ocklawaha with the canopy of trees reflecting in the water. Beautiful, it is truly lovely. 
Okay, so let's go back to the full screen here. Um, and I did want to ask you before we get into questions, I did want to ask you another question. We are a campus of the College of Central Florida, so obviously education is an enormous part of what we do. And I wanted to ask you, do you have any advice for young or emerging artists who might want to become full time artists? Do you have any tips, tricks that you want to share? Um. I, I, I think that, um, that there might be professions that you could get the training that you need in a certain window of time that you could look forward to saying, well, I'm going to go to, to such and such school and learn a certain trade of doing it. And, um, I, Painting in the way you look at the world, whether you're an impressionist, a realist, it, it, it is, it is uh, in a way a religion in how you look at the world. And um, one of the unusual things I'm just coming to understand is it wasn't everybody who got to go paint with an impressionist. I, I've studied with more than 70 different artists um, and, and get to work in the Vatican and do fresco techniques. I'm, I'm picking, uh, I'm doing something that's a little different to what you might think would be the next step in modern art. And that is that the artist has the luxury now to say, look at this amazing vision that the Impressionists had to see light in this way. Look at this amazing texture that, that, uh, that uh, was achieved in the Renaissance. Look at this vitality and passion in, in modern art and in, in uh, abstraction. Um, look at the, the terror, you know, the, the subject matter is wide open to you. And so uh, the thing that doesn't seem like it would be hard is to start figuring out who you are and be comfortable with who you are because your personal vision and one of the, I, I, I taught a class and I, I had the students came in and they wanted to do something important. So they thought doing something important was putting the wine bottle there with the grapes or a gold goblet or a this or a that, you know. And um, a lot of my paintings are pinfish and blue crabs and, and paper bags and, uh, you know, a pair of tennis shoes or whatever. Um, but it's personal. And, uh, you know, I said, go home, do something personal. This lady came back. She was just distraught. She said, you know, the only thing going on in my life is cleaning these dirty dishes. And she goes, so I drew that. I drew the kitchen sink with all these dirty dishes in it. And it was a beautiful drawing. She knew that it was personal. And she put it in the, uh, the student show at that art center and she won first place. And she was shocked. She thought, you know, she thought, so my, my, you know, to a student going out, you need to go look for artists who are making what it is who lifts you, who excites you. Don't just think I'm going to pick an art school and they're going to teach me that they teach art everywhere. I had individuals who, I was looking for who I could sense was the path that I wanted to go on. I got, I, they, I learned a lot from people. I, you know, you wouldn't know it, but I worked with the most avant-garde expressionistic contemporary artists. That was the, the majority of the teachers in my art school. Um, and they had great things to teach me, you know? Uh, it, it, it's just stay true to that course. Don't think you're doing something wrong because it isn't coming quickly. I, you know, um, 
I, I am, the other thing is, is, you know, I was told by a lot of people don't go into art. There's no way you can, you can survive. And you, I think you can, the greatest hope for you surviving is that you're passionate about doing things that are personal and meaningful to you. And you're going to have to hear a lot of criticism. That's the way it goes with art. Everybody's, you know, they get to know you, they'll like it. <laughs> you have to, have to make an effort to let people get to know you. Artists, you know, we always get, a lot of us, we got, we got chips on our shoulders because it's, you know, it's kind of funny putting yourself out there. And then, you know, so. Sorry, that was long. No, it was wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. So let's get to some of the questions from our people who are watching. Let me kind of go up here and find some of these. Um, is beauty, let me get the name of the individual. Christina asks, is beauty connected to the spiritual you mentioned in reference to your skies? Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, and that goes all the way back to the Phoenicians. The Phoenicians extracting a chemical from a marine snail so that they could make a beautiful uh, uh, dye of blue and purple, which is the black, the backfield of the Greek flag, of the Israeli flag, because the sky reflected in the sea was heaven reflected on earth and, and uh, the color of the water in the sky is, has always been a, um, and you know, good grief, just go outside. Do you think if, if you have any, any concerns, if you stand out and look out over water, it, it just is, um, it's a great comforter. Indeed. Jacob asks, what is something you would like to paint as a masterpiece, but haven't had a chance to do yet? Well, I am, I am really closing in on the piece behind me. Uh, it's been an incredible opportunity. My town has kind of asked me to paint uh, that history of or uh, a feeling of of a town of our town and that's led me to to greece to all parts of the country to to uh um meet the founders of our town and um i always believe that my masterpiece is the next painting I, I always believe that this is the one until it reaches uh, about, well, it reaches about 85, 90%. And then I start finishing it. And when I'm finished, I go, well, maybe the next one. <laughs> maybe the next one. The, the ever elusive. <laughs> it's, and it, you know what? And that's not a bad thing for an artist. It could be probably more tragic if you think you've done it and you stop, you know? So it's, you gotta keep producing, so. Indeed. Jacob had a second question as well. How important is capturing the true history of the area or event in your paintings? I, I, I think, uh, I think it's easy as an artist to become self-absorbed. Uh, and you're in a room by yourself and you're trying to think of all of these different things. I have in, in recent years really started to feel um, a, a, a responsibility to my home state to, to, to use the opportunities I've had in, in learning and being supported um, in what I do to go out there and, you know, I could, I could go out and, 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 and see someone uh, filleting a grouper and it could be hanging on a hook. And if it really moves me, 
I'll paint it and I'll try to paint the beautiful light coming through the translucent, whatever that is. I have come to find that people who live in Florida are very moved by seeing things about the place that they love and they've experienced. And, and I, I think that, you know, as the Hudson River School painters, their work became much more popular as landscape began to disappear. <clears throat> and 30, 40 years ago, when I painted palmettos and pine trees or blue crabs or was doing this, you wouldn't have even had a conversation with me. Everybody was pretty much like, we want more of your paintings from Italy. We want your, your Catskill Mountains in New York you're painting. Why are you painting, you know, a lot of the art collectors were flying over to Europe to buy art and they wanted everything I did in Europe. It was a hard road at first because people were not familiar with Florida as a subject matter. Out of the context of a commercial kitschy kind of re representation. And so, I became very excited that this is a wide open field where if I lived in Europe, I'd be continuing traditions painting like people had in the past. If I was in the Northeast, I would be either a figure painter or a landscape painter. Or I'd be a part of a certain society in a certain gallery. Florida, it's wide open. We are just beginning to tell our story here. And you're a museum is on that foundation of creating, you know, uh, the great museums that will one day be where people come to look at, at what, what Florida culture is and, and what we're about. You know, I, th I think a lot of museums, you're, you're actively collecting Florida art, which I have to applaud because a lot of museums just try so hard to look like museums in other parts of the world. And, um, you know, when you travel to Europe, you want to see Italian Renaissance painting. You want to see where you're from. And I think that's why you're successful with the number of people you attract to your museum. A lot of people are uh, find you current. Well, thank you. I appreciate that. We're happy, we're happy to collect Florida art. <laughs> it's, it's important. Um, Suzanne asks, can you talk about the large scale of some of your works? Is your ability to attend to the details enhanced with the size? Um, you know, the bigger it gets, the more you have to include though. <laughs> so uh, uh, I find that when someone's standing a few feet away from my painting, that when I paint it larger, they're experiencing the object the way I'm looking at it. Like, I feel like I can magnify what it is I'm interested in it, and it gives you that intensive feeling. That's not to say I do very tiny miniature paintings too. I go back and forth. I mean, after I've finished this huge painting behind me, you can be guaranteed that I'll go through a period of doing very small paintings. But um, I, uh, the breaking the frame, that's kind of an American uh, little uh, non-traditional uh, effect. And that's a little bit my frustration to say, these things are real. This isn't just a, a painting. I'm dying to try to make it real. You know, I'm very intentionally trying to do that. I like painting big. I like seeing it. It's like not as not as uptight getting, you know, there's lots of uptightness in this because then, you know, but anyway, <laughs> I'm attracted to uptight too. <laughs> <laughs> we so, all have our uptight moments. <laughs> you know, so, yeah. Well, thank you very much. Um, I think that is the last of our questions. I, I did want to mention to everyone too, before I sign off, I know Jonah did mention it in the chat as well, but the last two paintings that I showed in the PowerPoint 
are on view at the Appleton Museum of Art in a show I've entitled Visions of Florida. So you can come to the Appleton if you're anywhere in the area and see them. And I also wanted to quickly mention that for our heroes, our medical professionals and first responders, the rest of 2021 is free for our heroes. So we wanted to put that out there to thank our brave first responders and people who are really making a difference during what has been, I think we can all agree, a pretty challenging time. Yeah, I would, I would urge, uh, I, I remember coming into the Appleton Museum for the first time, I was astounded at the quality of the collection uh, that we have that here. It's a, it was a real, uh, it's a real gift to the community. So uh, absolutely beautiful collection. Thank you. And thank you for including me and thank you all for taking time to hear my two cents. Absolutely, absolutely. Thank you for coming. It has been just thrilling to have you. I wanted to mention one more thing before we sign off for the evening. This is a series, those of you that may be new to this this evening, this is an ongoing series. It is on the Appleton Museum of Arts YouTube channel. So this too is being recorded and they're all going to be on view on the Appleton Museum's YouTube channel. The next one is scheduled for Thursday. April 15th, and that will be artist Kristen Hertzog. She is a Florida artist as well, and she paints abstracts. So we're going from Christopher's very recognizable, beautiful work to completely abstract, gorgeous, saturated colors. She's a very interesting, introspective person, so I think you'll really enjoy it. So please do join us, same time, 7 p.m., on Thursday, April 15th for the next in our series. And I wanna thank you again for coming. We really appreciate your support. We appreciate you tuning in. A lot of you are from all over the place. So thank you for spending your Thursday nights with us. And we really appreciate it and look forward to seeing you again. Thank you, Christopher. And I hope that uh, you all might be interested in seeing when we unveil this new painting in Tarpon Springs for Advent Health North Pinellas um, that'll probably be coming up in early fall. Um, but uh, in come to beautiful Tarpon Springs. So uh, it's a special place. Yes, absolutely. That'll be a fabulous unveiling. So let's make sure it's all on our calendars as well. So again, thank you very much. I hope you all have a lovely evening and we truly appreciate you watching this evening. Good night. Thank you. Thank you.